I guess one of the questions that I get most often is people that want to do experiments with companies. People seem to think that's a very attractive thing to do because well, I don't know exactly why they think it's so good, um, to be totally honest. So we're going to talk now about some strategies that you could use if you want to do experiments. And I think they, there is no one optimal strategy. I think they're better for different parts of the, they have different strengths and weaknesses. So partnering with the powerful is like working with a company. Usually the cost to you is low because the company is paying for all the infrastructure already. The amount of control you have varies. Often companies won't let you do certain things that, for example, might make them look bad or might annoy their employees or customers. Uh, the amount of realism is very high because this is a company that, or, or NGO that's really actually doing this thing. And then the ethics of these are potentially complex uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, there are also some real scientific challenges that companies might not allow you to, again, I said, do certain kinds of research. They might potentially allow some companies, not every company, uh, wants pre-publication review of your paper. So imagine spending two years on a paper, you learn something bad about this company's customers, and then they kill the paper. So that is a very real possibility. Um, so this is, I guess, not exactly ethics in the sense that we've talked about before, but it's to emphasize that partnering with companies is, is good, but it's not always so great. Also, you probably won't be able to release your data. People won't be able to replicate what you've done. Sometimes you're not even allowed to say what the company was. So like there, it's, it's a mixed blessing, I would say. On the other hand, by working with companies, there are things that you could never, never do otherwise. Like, the field experiment, the Facebook thing about voting where they had 61 million people, like you just could not do that anywhere else. There are certain kinds of experiments about networks, for example, you could really never do anywhere but Facebook. There are probably certain kinds of experiments about online auctions that you probably could never do anywhere but Google or eBay. Like there's just certain things that if you want to do them, you got to go to these companies. But you should not think that's the only way to do it or necessarily the best way because it's trade-offs. Um, like Gary King was mentioning, sometimes politicians end up screwing up your experiment. Companies have very likely to do the same, <coughs> potentially do the same thing as well. Um, so how would you do this? Uh, so first is, this is called partner with the powerful, not have them give you their data. So I have a lot of people ask me, how can I get a company to give me their data? And I said, that's not, that's not the way to begin a relationship. It's like, give me, give me, give me. Uh, so you have to really think about how you can do something to contribute to help. It's a partnership. It's not a one-way flow. Um, so this often starts with a personal relationship. It's very unlikely that if you just email someone that you've never met before. Imagine someone emails you. You're busy, right? Someone emails you and says, hey, I want to like talk to you about this thing so you can spend a bunch of time giving me some stuff. Like, how are you likely to respond to that? probably not very well, and you should imagine that the people in the company will respond similarly. Um, one potentially really good way is to do an internship at the companies. Um, that is a way to actually get to know these people, build trust, understand what their actual goals are, so you can have a real partnership. Also, a lot of stuff about data access is much easier if you're an employee of the company rather than an outsider. So there are a lot of rules about data access that sometimes it can only be accessed by employees. So the easiest thing is then to become an employee. So this is some advice. And then the last piece of advice is finding these things that are both useful and interesting scientifically. So this idea of Pastor's Quadrant, I think, is incredibly helpful. So a lot of, especially sociologists, but I think more generally in social science, have this idea that there's like basic research that's pure scientific, and then there's like useful applied research, and these two things are really different. And I think that's not right. Uh, I think that there can be a lot of research that simultaneously is motivated by use and that seeks fundamental understanding. And this is the Pastor's Quadrant, which is from a book by Donald Stokes called Pastor's Quadrant. Um, and <coughs> 
basically the idea is you shouldn't think of a one-dimensional continuum, you should think of a two-dimensional continuum, and there is stuff that's not motivated by use uh, that seeks fundamental understanding. There's stuff that is uh, not motivated by fundamental. This is like 41 shades of blue. They were definitely worried about use, but they were not seeking fundamental understanding. And this is really where you want to be. You want to be doing both of these things. And a lot of tech companies think about this Pastor's quadrant. So like, if you go to Facebook data science team, they all know this, and a lot of them, at least the ones that I talk to, they really want to be here. Google Research talks about being here as well. Like, that's where they want to be, and if you can help them find that place, then it's much more likely to work out well for everyone. So we can, if, we can talk more about this at lunch if people want to share experiences trying to do this. Um, let's go to the next. So I also, I've actually never done this for experiments. So I work in this other space, which I call the just do it yourself space. Um, this has trade-offs, yeah? Did you try? Uh, not really. <coughs> Why? Personal preference. <laughs> um, I, I would in the future maybe. I mean, in some ways I guess I've done this more in, in my work about public health. I have done that. Uh, so when I want to do, do um, new methods for studying hard to sample groups, I've partnered with the UN and like the government in Brazil. And then I am very sensitive to that. I could talk much more about how that works in a public health setting, because I've definitely done that, where you have to be clear about meeting their goals, and you have to find a way to mix in your research in a way that helps them meet their goals and helps you meet your goals. And it's a delicate balance, but I think it can work really well. I personally like this model of a collaboration with a bartering like I sort of think of it as I'm rather than applying for a grant, I will trade my time and expertise to this organization that is doing this task, and then they will allow me to collect some data that I want. So I like that better than the like grant and paying people model. But then you have to find a partner that you want to have this partnership with, and that where you have something to barter, and they have something that they can barter back. Um, but I think. Also, you should all realize, I think sometimes people think, oh, I don't have anything that could help people at Facebook or Google, and that's just wrong. Like, everyone in this room can absolutely make a contribution if they partner with someone powerful, and building that partnership starts with you believing that. If you're like, don't believe that you have anything to contribute, then they're not likely to want to partner with you. Um, so... Another idea is to just use existing systems. So here, you don't actually have to do any, you can do experiments with no web development, no coding, nothing. So this is like the barn stars example from Wikipedia. It, you could do, anyone could have done that experiment. I mean, it's not, there's no big technical barriers. You don't have to negotiate. Uh, but technically, that's a relatively easy experiment to do. Low cost. You have relatively low control because you don't control the system. The system works however it works. Uh, the realism can be high, and then the ethics can be potentially complex because you're intervening in an existing system. And so you have to think about not just the possible harms to participants, but also the possible harm to non-participants and to the system as a whole. So if they had gone in and they had flooded and put in 2 million barn stars, which they could have done, there's nothing to stop there might be some kind of mechanism, but they could have flooded with barn stars. That would have messed up Wikipedia and the ecosystem there. And so there is this possible harm to the system itself, which is not something social scientists are used to thinking about because we don't normally, can't, can't usually operate at a scale like that. Uh, but you see this also some in political science, I think, where people start doing things with elections. There becomes a concern that they might start changing the election as something to be careful about. Build your own experiment. So um, many of you have done this. Uh, the cost, you have to, are medium because you have to actually do it. The control is very high. You get to do exactly what you want to do if you can build it. The realism is sometimes not as good. 
uh, and the ethics are relatively easy because you control the whole thing. The last is something that I don't see very often, but I think could become cool in the future. It is where you actually build an entire product that people want to use, and then you build experiments into that product. So the cost of this is high because it's very difficult to build something that people want to use. Uh, the control is very high because you're in charge. Uh, the realism is very high if it's an actual system that people are using. And again, the ethics are relatively easy. So an example of something like this is Movie Lens. This is a system that was developed uh, by a group of researchers at University of Minnesota, which is like a movie recommendation website. People use that website not because they're trying to help science, but because they want movie recommendations. So they have a user base of people using the site for real, and then they can do lots of experiments with that uh, user base. So <clears throat> these are what I see as the four options. There's some trade-offs. None of them are ideal for each situation. But you certainly you don't need to work with companies. And you don't need to be a very sophisticated coder. There is a range of experiments that you can do without a huge amount of cost and infrastructure. Yeah, uh, Maria and Joshua? Uh, in terms of building a product, this yes. is something I think about a lot. I was recently approached by Cornell Weil um, in New York City to think about using an app that they developed around health to collect health information um, to partner in um, East Harlem, which is where the Sullivan School of Social Work is, and which is there's <coughs> a lot of stuff happening there, uh, um, to put it lightly. But it's a little bit, um, I'm very cautious and wary a, they came to me, so I'm, I'm not sure what they want. Um, and B, I'm not sure that the population I care about would even use this particular yep. thing and not the real. That's a very, I mean, it's a very real concern about what people you're able to attract this way. We've talked a lot about recruiting people into experiments. So if you build a product that's attractive to some people and not to other people, then you're obviously only going to get some of those people in your experiments. Joshua, did you? Um, I had a, a comment and a question. Mm -hmm. The comment is just, I want to make sure everyone knows this. If you want to build your own experiment, Volunteer Science is a platform run by David Lazar's uh, laboratory at Northeastern. And they have a whole thing set up that makes it relatively easy to build your own experiment inside their platform. They give you a lot of stuff for free, including participants, <laughs> actually. And they don't pay their participants. They have a volunteer group. It's harder to get larger groups, but you can also recruit your own people to it once you build your experiment. Um, I'll also volunteer. Uh, Damon's lab has a platform, and if you ever want to build an experiment, we have a lot more control because we have both ends, and I'll happily help you code it if we can collaborate. Uh, the other thing is, I so I have kind of a question, which is this build a product thing. Yeah. I'm, I don't want to be like, oh, whoa, well, it's me. It's 2017, but it seems like that's a lot harder than it used to be. Like if you're building, say. A place online to get free music in, you know, 2003, right after Napster just shut yeah. down, is very different than doing it now. When the Spotify, I feel like people yep. have almost kind of app overload. Am I being pessimistic? Am I missing something here? Uh, I think that is a reasonable concern. Um, so this is very hard, right? There are tons of people who are trying to build useful products already. Uh, and you're now trying to build a useful product that is also scientifically useful, that generates data that's helpful to you, that's, it's a big challenge. But the reason why I included it is because I think it's one of the few strategies that gives you this virtuous cycle. So I'm very interested in cumulative advantage and feedback. And so if you build something that's successful, then more people will use it, then it gets better, then more people will use it, and you get this thing where like the movie lens people, they've been doing experiments for many, many, many years, and they get a tremendous amount of value from the fact that they have this working system that people like to use. So I would say building a product, very unlikely strategy, very likely to fail, but if it is succeed, does succeed, it would be very cool, and it's not something we normally think about, and we should maybe think about it a little bit more. The technical barriers, I agree, the, there's two kinds of barriers to building a product. One is the like competing against other people. That, I think, is getting harder. But the technical barriers of actually building something, that is actually getting easier. Um, so if you can be creative 
about seeing something that other people can't see in terms of an unmet need, you will be able to actually build it much easier now than you could have in 2003. Yeah? I think one counterbalance on that um, phenomenon that you're talking about that I think is sort of interesting is that um, there is one comparative advantage in academia, which is that we don't have to sort of justify the apps we make, say, on like a profit motive mm -hmm. base. So it's like, if you think about it, there are certain research questions that are really interesting, but you're going to lose tons of money doing it. But you could like make an app and then, um, you know, like through grants and things like that, you can do it. I guess I don't really find that helpful because the profitability comes presumably with the same thing we want, which is users. And sustainability. So the other so, thing yeah. about you can get some grants, like I got some grants for all our ideas. That thank, thank you, Google. Um, <laughs> they gave a bunch of grants to build that, and but eventually they stopped giving you money, right? They're like, all right, you're finished. You know, enough is enough. So then, how are you going to be sustainable? So like, you know, do you know Pocket, the app? It's like if you have articles. It's like a, you can think of it like it's like a Chrome extension and there's a little picture of a mm -hmm. pocket and when you want to save articles to read for later, you mm -hmm. click it. And that was developed um, by Mozilla, which is like, you know, open source. So mm -hmm. I think the open source community, it's been around for as long as computers have been around. Yeah. And there are, if you can get, so like going along with one of your themes, which is like if you can get people to want to do it. So yeah. the open source community, if they're motivated enough, you know, yeah, you, it can be sustainable in just open source. So that I don't, I, I don't actually believe. So like, I have, like, let's just take literally what happened to me last week. So I got an email from someone that wants to use all our ideas. They need HTTPS. So we could put up an issue on GitHub. I don't imagine anyone's going to come right away and like get excited about. It. There's an open source HTTPS. No, I know, but someone has to actually do it and make sure it works correctly, and someone has to deal with it when that system changes, like Let's Encrypt is the one that we're yeah. using. Let's Encrypt is going to change. The platform that we're using, we're, we're hosting it on uh, Engine Yard. That's going to change. The way they work together is going to change. Like I think there is a role for this volunteer community to play, but I think that has to be supplemented by at least some professional paid developers. That has been my experience. And so when I talk about the Open Review Toolkit, this little pitch for my thing about the Open Review Toolkit, that's an open source project, but it has a revenue model uh, to make it sustainable. So I hope that we'll have some open source contributions. That would be awesome. But I want to have some paid developers, and I think there has to be a coexistence of those. Do you want to say it, Anna? Yeah, I was just going to weigh in a little. Um, it you have to have something to give to the open source community in the thing that you're building. A majority of contributions come from people who are using the thing that um, that they're contributing to. So if you were to put out a request to say, hey, you know, someone can come along and do this thing and add HTTPS, if no one in your user demographic um, who's already a part of this ecosystem knows how to do it, it's unlikely to get done. So there's, um, there's a really big challenge, which is actually, I, we can have this conversation offline. That's something my group is working on to take that and translate it to that next step. Find that community around a piece of software and then make that initial launch and figure out who are the people who are motivated enough to start contributing to a thing. Yeah, I want to have that conversation. Because um, that is a problem I've run into. Uh, and that is also an accurate description of all the stuff that's gone into like when I said it's been translated into 15 languages, those were because people, they actually wanted to use it. They're like, I want, I, I'm using this in my school. Everyone there speaks Indonesian. I need to translate it into Indonesian. And then we have to enable them to contribute. We have to build some infrastructure for that. But no one just showed up saying they wanted to help. I mean, they want, they want, to, they want to help, but for their own reasons. Yes. So in your yeah. case, is it, is it feasible for the people who want HTTPS to build? No, because of the way it has to do with things about this. We don't want to give them access to the server. I mean, like... Oh, so that's a particular... That is a particular thing, but in general, like, let's say we want to make it work well with mobile. 
So like that was a challenge. The first version wasn't designed well to work with mobile. The second generation was. That we couldn't just put that out for people to do. That was like a pretty it's not a particularly exciting thing to do. It has to be done with care. Uh, so it ended up that there was a person that wanted it, this state in Brazil. There was someone who was willing to pay for the work, which was the World Bank. They hired a team of developers to do it. Then we had to actually have our developer do some extra work to get and merge it back in. So it's true that it was done by volunteers, but not really, they weren't really volunteers. They were, you know, like, they were happy to contribute back, but it wasn't just like totally easy stuff just shows up at your door that works. There's also an additional cost to being able to produce something that other people can collaborate on in terms of software. So you have to document a lot more. You have to be very precise about your design. You have to be really explicit about where um, the kinds of things that you want contributions about and the kind of things that you don't. Because the worst thing that you want to do is someone puts in a lot of effort and then they push change and you're like, well, that's actually not what we need right now. And then you lose a valuable contributor. So I think we should propose a discussion about contributing to and creating open source projects. Yes. It would be both parts, right? Because we might want to contribute as yeah. well as create. All right, can we? Taylor's not here. I'll tell Taylor we should try to do that. Oh, I, I think this is, going back to the mesh collaboration from the other day, yeah. this, these are all really important points I think to keep in mind. We get, like with Linux and, and everything, we get really excited about this idea of, oh, distributed parallel processing. But all of these examples have a central node that is accepting or rejecting decisions and integrating. So um, I, I think about that a lot because, you know, in, in the collective intelligence space, people mm -hmm. get really excited about these processes and, and they try to build systems and platforms where things just run themselves. But um, centralization as problematic as, as it can be in some circumstances is also still really important and also often unavoidable. Yeah. OK. So these are what I see as the four models. Uh, you can try to find one that fits the situation that you have the best. <laughs>